the world is changing fast. New technologies are impacting how we think about products, services, and the way we live our lives. Nowhere is this trend more present than in financial services, where new business models and customer expectations are changing our conceptions about banking, finance, and the very nature of money. Welcome to ReBank, a visionary podcast about banking, fintech, and the future. The future of banking is here. Hello and welcome to ReBank. I'm your host, Will Beeson. Today we're thrilled to be joined by Tim Sievers, CEO and founder of Deposit Solutions. Deposit Solutions is an open banking platform for deposits, connecting banks and depositors across Europe. The platform allows banks to offer attractive third-party deposit products to their own customers through existing accounts. Deposit Solutions has worked successfully with banks across Europe, has mediated deposits in excess of 2 billion euros, and employs a team of over 100 people across Hamburg, London, and Zurich. Of note, which we get into in the conversation, famed investor and PayPal co-founder Peter Thiel was an early investor in Deposit Solutions and has continued to support them in further rounds. As always, connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, or on our website at bankingthefuture.com. If you like today's show, please subscribe on iTunes, or wherever you listen to your podcasts, and leave us a review. Thank you very much for joining us today. Please welcome Tim Sievers. Tim, welcome to ReBank. Thank you. Tell us a bit about Deposit Solutions. Yeah, happy to. Um, so Deposit Solutions' um, focus is to bring open banking to the product category of deposits. So... Um, we are basically enabling banks to offer to their own customers the deposit products of third-party banks under the existing client relationship. That's the innovation. That means for the saver that he has more choice and better rates in a product category that is important for many people. For the what we call the client bank, so the bank that holds the relationship, it means that they can serve a product category competitively um, that would be difficult to serve off the own balance sheet. And for the deposit-taking institution, it just means that by listing their offers on our platform, they can increase the addressable market for their offers and reach um, market segments, captive client groups of other banks that would otherwise not be easy to reach for them. I should warn our listeners quickly, we're sitting here in uh, Innovate Finance's brand new offices at uh, Broadgate Circle in the city of London, where uh, I think looking out the window and counting, there are easily half a dozen cranes. You may hear some construction work in the background, but uh, hopefully won't be too distracting. Tim, I understand there are two sides to your business, a B2B side and a B2C side, uh, I guess, to, to put things simply. Can you explain maybe both parts in a bit more detail? Yes, of course. So um, the B2C part of our business is, acts basically like a client of our open banking platform. Um, that means, like other banks, it uses the platform to... Um, access deposit offers of what we call the product banks, the deposit-taking institutions, and it markets those directly to, at the moment, German savers. It runs under the brand of Zinspilot, zinspilot.de in Germany, and um, as a customer, you can open an account with Zinspilot once and then benefit from a single account solution for deposits, i.e. use all the deposit offers listed on Zinspilot with this one account without ever having to open another uh, bank relationship. So, so you would as the customer, uh, kind of go on and actively select which offer you wanted to take up? Or is there any automation in terms of sweeping deposits from one account to another? Yeah, no, that, there is no automation. So the uh, basic idea is that the customer is presented with a choice of different banks who offer different products from instant access over notice accounts to a fixed term deposit offers. And then the customer chooses what he likes, um, pays in the desired amount, and uh, holds this deposit offer with the respective bank, and uh, we are offering a settlement service, making it really easy and convenient to use, and the customer can then also easily spread his money across different banks and different products and uh, have all the products in, in one portfolio and get you know one set of documentation, um, unified tax treatment, all these things. Hmm. Okay, sorry, so I interrupted. That was the, the B2C side. Th that is the B2C side. It's, it's acting like a client 
of our own platform and this same platform we also open up to use for other banks who can implement this into their systems and then offer to their own customers exactly this service to access all the de deposit products listed on our platform um, and offer them to their own customers. They can curate the offerings so they have control about which offers uh, to um, bring to which of their customers. Um, but uh, it's it's the same principle like Zinspilot other banks can also use our open banking platform for deposits uh, to implement. And if I'm not mistaken, there's a, a deposit origination component too for, for banks that, uh, that you guys work with. And that may not be through the customer-facing proposition that you mentioned, which I probably won't try to pronounce, but the Zinspilot. Uh, That's right. <laughs> interest product. rate navigator. In right. Germany. Okay. They're interest rate navigator. Product. <laughs> Currently focused on Germany. <laughs> but there's there's a back-end component too, which is about helping banks uh, generate liquidity. Is that right? Yeah. So that, exactly. I mean, for the product bank, the big difference is, apart from what I earlier said earlier about reaching um, new market segments, the big difference is that they don't have to duplicate the retail infrastructure um, to address those customers. So if I was a British bank, like we have a number of UK banks using our platform to source deposits from Germany or a French bank sourcing deposits from Germany through Zinspilot, for instance, or one of our client banks uh, in Germany, then they don't actually need to set up and run a retail infrastructure in Germany serving those German retail savers, uh, but they can um, make use in a way uh, to of the existing retail infrastructure run by the banks or Zinspilot who do this uh, not just for the funding, but uh, to serve the customer more comprehensively. So the benefit from the banks who are accessing uh, German depositors is basically that they can they can access the liquidity that they need to support the asset side of their balance sheet without building out the retail origination, uh, you know, customer support, uh, customer management. Uh, exactly. Component. Is that it? Yeah, it's, it's about diversifying and deepening your funding base. Um, without uh, the operational complexity and the investment that would otherwise be required mm -hmm. to do that. So it, I have to admit, the concept seemed pretty bold when I first heard about it, uh, specifically kind of the concept of, of banks effectively, uh, you mentioned curating, but, but, but providing access to their own customers of other banks' uh, savings products. What was the, the process like getting banks to sign up early on? Um, so I, I think, you know, we started already in um, in 2011. I quit my job in 2010 to pursue the idea full time. And we took the first um, client bank live with a sort of full setup in 2014. So you can see how it took a while um, because it's sort of a new process design for the and new value chain design really for the product category of, uh, of deposits. And... Um, for banks, it is not easy to uh, use something that's new because they have to make sure it, it you know, it works. Uh, regulation is fine with it. Uh, compliance is ensured, and all these things. So we had to have many discussions. In fact, um, setting up our own B two C offering as the sort of first client of our own of the open banking platform really helped with this because we were able to show, uh, firstly, this works. Everyone's fine with it. Customers love it. We won. Um, Customer Satisfaction Awards three years uh, in a row with with the offering. And there was a lot of traction too, so you could see there was demand for the solution. So this helped us a lot uh, with building the confidence within the uh, banks that followed on the client bank side. Uh, even Deutsche Bank in Germany today, with its 8 million retail customers, has now implemented our solution. It helped us a lot convincing them uh, that, this is, uh, that it makes sense to do this and that the product category overall uh, deposits will be served in an open banking model in the future. You guys recently announced a partnership with Adam Bank in the UK. You mentioned you have a handful of UK banks uh, that you work with. What do you think uh, led Adam or, or indeed any of these other customers to, to work with you guys? Uh, it would seem, so certainly lower cost of deposits uh, potentially, but I guess there's FX risk built in. Uh, they must have been pretty sure that uh, this was going to be a transformative thing for them. Yeah, so I think for Adam, uh, an important aspect was, like for many other of our product banks, important aspect was that this is a way for them to address um, a new market, uh, to source deposit funding from a new mar market. So it's diversifying uh, the funding mix. Um, it's also a um, great way for them to be in a market that is maybe a little less competitive than the um, UK savings market. 
um, and source funds at uh, lower costs. You're right that, of course, the exchange rate has to be swapped out and this costs a little too. Uh, but still the business case makes a lot of sense for many banks um, and uh, even to fund uh, rich pound denominated assets uh, sourcing euros can be a very sensible move especially as you are just I mean for any funding need um, the larger the addressable market of your products the lower the required um, interest rates you have to show so I think it uh, it's probably um, uh, these considerations that that uh, that were an important factor for Atom. So these banks are effectively able to access a lower net cost of funding by, by raising euro deposits, swapping them into pounds, uh, and, and doing that via, via your platform than, than raising deposits direct in the UK. Yeah, so it's a, I think it's whatever else you're doing, it's a great complementary um, channel mm -hmm. uh, to do on top. Um, just because, you know, for the diversification and the uh, increase of the addressable market for mm -hmm. your products. Now, I, I imagine that uh, a lot of blending is involved and it may be difficult to compare like for like per se, but um, how do retail deposit rates in Germany generally compare to the UK, for instance? So I think uh, euro rates are a little uh, lower, I would say. Um, and um, the... Uh, ECB has uh, obviously with um, lower rates uh, contributed to that. Um, you do see, depending on who, which bank is entering the market, you do see um, variations over time there too. Uh, but I think generally one, it's fair to say that uh, Germany is a competitive uh, market in terms of cost of funds for UK banks, uh, even when taking into consideration swap costs. Can you talk a bit about the, the integration with your platform? I and mean, if, uh, if new banks are interested in... Uh in, in working with you guys, yeah. How so, intensive is that? I mean, it's, it's sort of the two sides need to be considered separately, I guess. The product bank side, which is the deposit taker uh, side, uh, for um, for the product bank, it's very um, easy to uh, implement our solution because they basically interact with what we call a um, service bank um, in the respective. Uh, Market so that's either for Zinspilot, a, a contractually bound service bank we work with, or for the client bank implementations, it's the client bank itself, so Deutsche Bank, um, who um, assist in the settlement. Um, basically, uh, this means for the deposit taking institution that it doesn't have to open up individual retail accounts for each German saver, uh, but it can, um, in terms of operational model, this is like institutional funding almost in terms of the simplicity of the model. Uh, they get lo full look through to all the individual savers and all the input they need for their reporting and the compliance and you know AML and all these these things, uh, but they don't have to build the retail infrastructure to run it all themselves. Um, so uh, onboarding is a sort of four to eight week project and is uh, very simple and easy to do. For the client bank side, it depends on the implementation model a little bit how. Um, how, how, whether it's an offline point of sale or an online point of sale, we support uh, both models. Um, generally speaking, we provide APIs and a mapping of all the re relevant business processes and uh, the implementation uh, would typically a little longer than the product bank side, but uh, can um, easily be done in three to six months depending on the implementation model. So now for perhaps the most important question. Um, you guys raised money from from Peter Thiel. Have you met him? <laughs> uh, yes, I, I met him um, a, f a few times. Uh, he um, uh, he uh, was in Vienna at a conference when a um, shareholder of ours um, uh, helped me get a meeting with him. And um, I was very glad that after that session, um, he decided to invest. And it was actually a, f a funny story because he was only in Europe for a couple of days, so he decided to stay on California time. And I had the pleasure of pitching to him at three o'clock in the night, <laughs> European time, um, which was uh, quite an interesting experience. But um, we are very happy to have him. I was talking to uh, a colleague of yours, Tom, uh, earlier, who was telling me about a, uh, a party that he attended at Peter Thiel's house in L.A., now, is that just like an office myth, or, or can you can you confirm? <laughs> I wasn't at that party, so I can't tell. <laughs> so, uh, all right, joking aside, I think um, so. Peter Thiel invested in Deposit Solutions, if I'm not mistaken, via um, his investment vehicle uh, Valor. 
what do you think motivated uh, Valor's investment? What, what was um, it do you think that they saw? Yeah, so I think uh, um, actually when, when Peter first decided to invest, he invested with Teal Capital and through another uh, instrument and then uh, or vehicle of his. And then in a subsequent round when, round when he uh, w decided to um, increase his stake in the company, uh, also Vala joined um, as uh, also a, a fund where he is significantly involved. Um, and I mean, Peter Thiel sort of generally, I think, uh, has the investment uh, hypothesis to pick business ideas that can have a big impact. And I think that is clearly something he bought into and that uh, we are convinced of because in the um, deposit business across Europe, I think we have the chance to really um, set up a new and much more efficient and much more user customer friendly um, value chain model by um, enabling uh, with our platform, we, we enable the deduplication of infrastructure. So not every bank has to set up uh, a retail infrastructure and every market it wants to source deposit funding from. So in a simple, uh, as a sort of simple illustration, maybe if you have sort of five savers and five banks in the old uh, value chain model, you get 25 uh, individual retail accounts being run, each bank with each of those customers. And with our setup, there are only the five accounts that uh, are run anyway because those customers have relationship with their home bank for instance and then um, with the help of our platform um, the uh, deposit taking institutions can get all the information and input they require without duplicating the actual customer relationship and that's a much more efficient model it's better for banks it's better for the savers and it can really change the sort of 10 I think 10 trillion euros or 10,000 billion euros uh, European deposit market, and I think that's what got him excited, and that's what that's what's exciting us. <laughs> Obviously, Germany's a a big market, um, but if your vision is to disrupt the deposit market, to innovate on on in the deposit market in a way that uh, that interests Peter Thiel, presumably you're not expecting to limit your long term aspirations to Germany. What are plans for expansion throughout? Europe yeah, that's right. So, I mean, we are um, in Germany, that's sort of where we started and we have our la the largest footprint as of today. But we're in the process of uh, rolling out our offer uh, to Switzerland and to the UK um, and also um, have started to evaluate some other European countries. So we are quite keen on um, actually pursuing this European opportunity aggressively. And th uh, that has obviously the advantage of being sort of a, Euro a uh, regulatorily harmonized um, region and um, what we'll do outside of Europe, we will see over the years to come. So it seems to me like this is, this may be in part what you're, what you're saying, uh, part of a, a much larger transformation in, in bank business models. Uh, you guys are basically saying that banks can, if they wanted to, uh, focus on lending. Uh, for instance, a, a bank could launch, uh, could raise all of their deposits uh, via a platform like Deposit Solutions and focus on uh, on, on growing assets exclusively if they wanted to. Uh, we're, we're already seeing back-end only banks like Solaris Bank, Wirecard, and Fedora OS basically building the back-end infrastructure, carrying the banking license, and, and, and using that to support either fintech plays or, or other banking plays in the front end. Do you see deposit solutions playing a role in the, the transformation of bank business models? Um, yes, I mean, I certainly hope we are uh, we are part of the big picture here, and, and I see uh, a number of macro trends uh, which I think are driving um, a specialization um, to the extent that I believe there will be banks focusing on the more and more on the client relationships, so serving the customers' needs comprehensively at the point of sale, and on the other hand, banks that will do everything, optimize their balance sheet, their risk know-how, their cost structure to be really good in particular product areas and um, they will be looking to connect to as many distribution channels as they can for these uh, competitive product propositions and I think those two groups of banks will need a an infrastructure uh, to connect a sort of middleware of the new financial economy and that's our spot in the value chain that's what we want to build for deposits um, help uh, client focused banks um, and uh, product-focused banks, if you will, um, to exchange data on uh, product information, customer information, um, and with the settlement of the transactions. And I believe in that sort of value chain model, 
um, we have an important role to play for the product category of uh, deposits. Um, and I think this is actually something that you can see already shaping up a little bit and the drivers um, the drivers behind it are, are not going to go away, I think, because uh, you have uh, basically regulation and technology at work to abolish switching costs. It's really easy. It be, it's becoming easier and easier for customers to uh, go to another bank and use their offer if their home bank cannot offer anything uh, competitive. And then also customers are uh, better informed. They're more, more and more educated, so they are in a better position to tell a good product from a, a bad product. So um, I think this sort of open bank is an inevitability. This, uh, there's a lot of pressure, I think, on banks who really want to own the relationship um, to put themselves in a position to service their customers' important needs uh, competitively and well, and we can help with that. Switching gears slightly, uh, you guys have been at this for a relatively long time, I guess. What, uh, six, seven years, you said? That's right. So you must have uh, a world of advice for for other startup founders. I mean, what what would what would your I don't know key piece of advice to to someone looking to to start a fintech uh, or, or indeed a technology business in another space be? Um, well, that's that's a tough one. I, I think um, it depends a little bit, of course, what you are planning to do. Um, generally, my experience is everything. Uh, takes twice as long as you think you have conservatively planned it will take. Um, so to, I think to make room for that and especially when selling to banks uh, or in the financial services space, um, that is a challenge. Uh, um, the other thing is, I think, especially in fintech, it's easier to, I think, when you start thinking, when you can find a model where banks are customers rather than, uh, than uh, the enemy. Um, but obviously there are... Uh, product ideas out there where that's not really an option so perhaps on on a on a similar note i mean um if you were starting deposit solutions again today is there anything you would do differently well i mean there are i'm sure we've made lots of mistakes and could have done tons of things better but i can't think of a sort of specific thing that we should have done differently i think overall the strategy we adopted was um was uh, the right one and it was necessary also to get into the market so uh, also with our with our b2b um, approach uh, using a our own b2c proposition as a proof of concept i think that was an important aspect um, uh, i mean ideally we maybe could have done everything a little quicker but that uh, it was dependent uh, depending on outside factors too so it's sure uh, but was was there a regulatory challenge at any point? Uh, um, no, well, it was something new. It's about sort of, prop it's not, uh, we are not mediating accounts. It's not so, like uh, some established business model already. So this is, uh, there's sort of really some sort of business process and value chain redesign going on. So I made a point of checking in with the German regulator, Bafin, the German deposit insurance, and then subsequently also the uh, regulatory authorities of the other markets we went into we have product banks from 15 European countries now. Um, so it was important, I think, to get everyone uh, to, to communicate early and uh, make sure everyone's well informed about it. There wasn't a regulatory challenge, but I think the challenge was just to get everyone uh, familiar and uh, clear about what we're doing. But the, the reception, once people understood the model and the motivations for it was generally yeah. good? Yeah, no, very good. I mean, and, I mean, look, th this is really what everyone's talking about, the regulators and policymakers. It's about uh, making an important product category more transparent, uh, giving customers more choice um, and uh, better rates on their savings. So this is, this is great from a consumer perspective. And it is also great uh, from the bank's perspective because you, we, can, we help banks diversify and deepen, deepen their funding base. And that is something that uh, obviously makes banks more stable and contributes, I think, on a more general level also sort of onto a, this is sort of adding social welfare, I think. Tim, where can people connect with you and find out more about your work? Um, well, I'm on LinkedIn, um, I guess, uh, easiest to find there, I suppose. Um, otherwise, we obviously have a website and uh, their email addresses and contact details. Um, so anyone who would like to get in touch, uh, welcome to... Um, approach me. Great, and I guess they should call their banks and ask them to uh, onboard. Yes, that's right. The interest rate tracker tool. <laughs> ask for the open banking solution for there deposits. <laughs> Tim Sievers, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks a lot, Phil. 
Thanks for tuning in to Rebank. If you liked today's show, reach out. Follow us on Twitter at Rebank Podcast and join the conversation. For more on banking, fintech, and the future, check out our regular content at www.bankingthefuture.com.